Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale University. And we're trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. This week, we will be speaking with Professor Greg Gonzalez. But first, we'd like to check in on current health news. Yeah, so I'll take that, Howie. So I wanted to ask you, you know anybody who's got COVID? <laughs> I feel like I'm the only person in my circle who has not yet been infected. I, I did go for my booster today, but not necessarily because I personally wanted to, but because the university is, is sort of making me get uh, but, but there's a lot of people around us who have COVID, right? And, and not oh only my God. people who've had COVID, but there are people I know, lots of people who had COVID and now have it again. Have you noticed that? Yes, absolutely. So, so anyway, people are writing about this. There was a nice piece uh, by Eric Topol, by the way, just for our listeners. I mean, Eric has just done extraordinary service throughout the pandemic. We're going to have him on the podcast. I thought that was, yes, that'll so be amazing. Thankful people, for that. people can hear Eric. And his Twitter, terrific to follow. And he also has something nice on Substack where he really reviews things. He had a recent one that came out. Eric was writing about a paper that was just published out of the VA. And recently they posted a preprint, just for people listening, preprint is, hasn't been peer reviewed or published in a, in a journal yet, but they, they looked at about 250,000 people with one infection, about 40,000 people with two infections, and, and almost a little more than 5 million people who are uninfected controls. And they looked to see, you know, what, what's up with these reinfections? Are they more or less dangerous? What happens to people? And, uh, you know, it was, interesting because these reinfections it seemed were associated with higher risk over time and so the people who had more infections and almost like a we call a dose response that is the more infections you had the riskier it was and even though this is among variants that we think are becoming less dangerous over time but actually in the VA they're describing it as actually being a bigger problem and uh, even with regard to mortality as well. Now, people may wonder like, well, actually, why are these reinfections becoming so much more common? And you may be reading about these variants and I know people's eyes glaze over with all these number of Omicron BA.2, BA.2.12.1. I mean, it starts to get numbing after a while. But what I think is important for people to know is that there's a new variant that has been coming out that BA.4 slash five that seems to be accounting for about a third of the infections right now in the United States. It's new. And people talk about this immune evasion, that these variants are able to dodge our immune system, that even if you've been vaccinated or if you've been previously infected, that because of the mutations that are occurring, particularly on the spike protein, the part that's sticking out, and that's what a lot of the antibodies are to, that spike, that, that these mutations are changing it just enough so that our, it's dodging our immune system. And that's why you're seeing so many different people who are able to have been priorly infected. They think they're, they're protected, but in fact, th this sneaky little virus is finding ways to spread among the population. And, and this VA study is in counter distinction to a lot of the studies that have came out that have suggested that the recent variants are not as dangerous, but the thing is they're infecting more people. And so the result of infecting more people, even if it's slightly less dangerous as a, as a virus, may actually be causing harm that's greater. And, and we'd, we'd written about this and other people have seen it. I think the one thing to comment on too is Eric at the end of this uh, makes a very strong statement that and I think reflecting a little bit on Congress has yet to pass the COVID-19 bill. I mean, so, you know, a lot of the funding for future public health is still in question. And he says the lack of priority and resource allocation stems from the illusion that the pandemic is behind us, which is obviously off base. Yep. Anyway, we should get on to Greg because this will be a great interview. <laughs> I'm delighted to introduce Professor Greg Gonzalez. Greg Gonzalez is an associate professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health. His work involves modeling infectious disease and substance use, while also investigating public policy and health equity. Professor Gonzalez has worked on HIV AIDS and various global health issues with organizations such as the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power or ACT UP, the Treatment Action Group, Gay Men's Health Crisis, and many more. He is the epitome of an interdisciplinary colleague 
working with our law school as an adjunct associate professor of law and the co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership, uh, a Yale Law School and School of Public Health initiative to respond to problems in health justice, and also works with faculty at our School of Management and beyond. He is a 2018 winner of the MacArthur Fellowship, or Genius Grant, as it is commonly known. I first came to know him when he came to Yale's campus to obtain his bachelor's degree in 2008 as a 44-year-old man through the Eli Whitney Students Program. Since that time, he has also obtained his PhD from our School of Public Health and obviously enriched our campus with his passion, his deep abiding belief in informing policy with science and evidence, and his commitment to social justice and equal rights for all. First, let me just start off by saying how much I appreciate you joining us. You have consistently stood up for those who either can't or won't be noticed if they do. With so much injustice in the world, how do you prioritize your efforts? Well, you said it was a simple question you were gonna ask, but it's, it's pretty difficult. And, you know, I was on a call with, um, a prep call for a, a webinar with Partners in Health that's happening next week. And there are people there who are gonna talk on abortion rights and reproductive justice, on gun control and on immigration. And we had a conversation about how do you prioritize all of that? And I said, we agreed we should put it under one big umbrella that counts as public health and not try to sort of triage and rank things in order of importance because that's what they like to do. They like to pick you off, right? To say that you work on one issue and you don't need to think about the rest of the sort of broad scope of what public health entails in America. And so I would say, you know, I do what I know best, which is um, stuff around HIV, substance use and infectious diseases. But I'm um, trying to listen to my colleagues and, and promote my colleagues' work uh, on all the other fields that I think are sort of under our big tent of public health. Can you comment a little bit on you? you uh, two things, I guess. One is that you dropped out of college. I would love to know why and when you did that the first time. But the second is that, you know, when I first met you, I remember realizing that you and I were contemporaries and you'd come back to, to college to do your undergraduate degree in evolutionary biology uh, and developmental biology, I think. Um, and you were already so successful, Greg. I mean, I described it in the bio, but it understates your impact on how we affected change or how you affected change during the HIV AIDS crisis. How do you, you know, first of all, how did that happen? And second of all, what can you tell people who think that at the age of 44, it's too late to go back to school or too late to make a career pivot like that? So um, we're contemporaries and I think you'll understand this is that in, I graduated from high school in 1981. Two events happened around that time, the election of Ronald Reagan and the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And coming out yep. as a young gay man in a conservative suburban New York family of second generation immigrants was incredibly difficult. And I'd been the best little boy in the world and, you know, done well at school, was succeeding, was going off to consider a research career in comparative literature. I studied Russian and just it, none of it made sense. And I felt this compulsion to sort of rethink my life in the context of what was happening around me and I dropped out of school and I ended up meeting somebody who was HIV positive the first HIV positive person I knew um, and went looking for information and ended up in ACT UP and then sort of found my people found my tribe and that's why I ended up you know never returning to school until I was you know 44. I thought coming to Yale was going to be like a sabbatical from work like I would, it would just be sort of this nice time to sort of reflect being in biology courses with Yale undergraduates was slightly terrifying. Um, you know, <laughs> they're all heading to medical school and I was sitting there 44 years old with like a lot of distance between me and the last science course I took. Um, but it was fun. It was, it, was, it was incredibly thrilling. Steve Stearns, who was my advisor as an undergraduate and Paul Turner, who's you know, basically my co-advisor, really opened up this new world to me about evolution and infectious diseases, which was totally fascinating. I almost left and went to do a, a lab-based PhD in Europe on sort of um, immunogenetics and, and simian immunodeficiency viruses. But, you know, it's funny because it didn't occur to me that there was, I would never took an, um, a linear path from A to B in my life, so it didn't occur to me that it was odd to go back to school at 44. You know, my mother, who is, you know, 88 years old, was a school teacher in New York City for many, many years. And then in her 
60s, well, he retired from the New York City public health public school system and became a politician, a Republican politician on Long Island. Um, and so, you know, and only retired, you know, five or six years ago. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I watched my mother sort of pivot, you know, after retirement into a huge sort of local political career, which, you know, gave me the sense, I guess, like in retrospect, that like, if she can do it, I probably can too. But- but how did you come to apply to Yale at that point? I mean, what was the thing that made you think, I'm going to apply to Yale? So I was sitting in South Africa in my apartment in Cape Town. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this work for 25 years. And um, I, I loved it. I mean, the job I had then was really dealing with the the Tabo and Becky administration in South Africa and their refusal to give any oral therapy to people in the country, but also to sort of, um, go into countries around the region with my colleagues at the Treatment Action Campaign and teach people about the virology, immunology of HIV, about clinical trials and all this stuff. And um, I realized, you know, I could do this forever um, or I could take a break and try to do something else. And I was looking around the internet for like um, (laughs) programs that would take older undergraduates. Um, And I saw the Yale one and I said, oh, I'll just apply. Um, and, um, I said, if I get in, I'll go, if not, I'll just, um, keep doing what I'm doing. And, you know, one day I got a a letter in Cape town and, you know, decided to get on a plane and come back to the U S. And the rest of this history, I I just, I just want to ask you, you know, I think for some of our listeners we're we're now you know, 41 years into the HIV AIDS epidemic right now, there was that window of time for the first 15, 18 years where it was just not only just lethal, but it was filled with misinformation, just filled with it. Um, And I think for a lot of people going through the COVID pandemic right now, there's this expectation that after two years, we should know everything. And I think back, even now we're learning so much about HIV and we've had several guests talk about this already. But I think back to that period of time where the information flow was so high for so long and so many myths were being dispelled, you know, what is the role for activists during, I mean, right now in the COVID pandemic, what's the role for people to be pushing back against misinformation, to be defending stigmatized populations? How do you see that looking back on that period in time? So it's interesting, you know, misinformation on the AIDS epidemic, you know, started in the beginning, you know, and the idea that HIV didn't cause AIDS was propounded by Peter Duisberg, who was a National Academy of Medicine member. Carrie Mullis, who who was the Nobel Prize winner, who just who sort of discovered or, or developed PCR, um, you know, and it's being propagated around the country, it was turbocharged by Tabo and Becky in South Africa. And around 2000, a group of us um, set up something called AIDS Truth, and it was clinicians, it was basic um, geneticists and biologists, um, and it was AIDS activists. And we basically sort of deconstructed all the sort of myths, put up all the sort of scientific evidence, and did it in in a simple um, engaging format so people could understand what was going on. With COVID-19, everything is just sort of nuclear scale um, misinformation, you know, and, you know, for 2020, lots of it was coming out of the White House. We were talking about people like um, uh, Jay Bhattacharya and Johnny Yanides and, and um, Scott Atlas and others. Um, we have people within our own institutions now who are, who are propelling misinformation forward, um, myocarditis and in young children and vaccines, you know, the, uh, uh, the the scale of the misinformation now is really, 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 really pervasive and coming from the highest levels of government. The governor of Florida, for instance, is a is a, a, a pretty strong proponent of um, not giving vaccines to children. Has made comments about the the state of the the pandemic and and his own his own state surgeon general has been a problematic figure in terms of for padding misinformation. We need to speak out. We're not just clinicians and scientists, we are citizens in a country that we need to give back to. And part of that is sort of setting the record straight about what's true and what's not true, what's what's science and what's myth and, and fabrication. You, you, your work with HIV and now your commentary and work with monkeypox, 
Um, in, in one of the articles, you mentioned something or were quoted as saying something about how we have to become more comfortable talking about sex. Um, you know, here we are at a time where uh, the LGBTQ uh, community is being uh, further marginalized in large parts of the country right now, where we're taking step steps backward in talk, terms of, of freedoms and uh, particularly women's agency, but really the agency of, of anybody with regard to reproductive health and sexual health. Um, how do we move the needle in a way that's productive for society? Monkeypox is not anywhere near the level of concern that COVID was, but there is concern and you've raised this sort of weight between us being able to contain it versus just mitigating it, which would By be By the a way, failure. should we still be saying monkeypox or is there a new name yet for it? I don't know. Well, I think, I think the new names are gonna be around the Congo and West African um, variants. Um, but, you know, this is not COVID. But, you know, there's a real chance that this virus could establish itself in among men or sexual men, among gay men, bisexual men. Um, and that's a choice, right? You know, we, you know, a few weeks ago, I wrote a piece that talked about a thousand cases worldwide. Now we have 3000 cases worldwide in 41 countries. Um, it, it's spread by close physical contact. Um, in the context of the current outbreak outside of its endemic regions, it's happening among, among many men or sex with men. Um, and while it's not a sexually transmitted disease, um, it's happening in the context of social and sexual networks. And so um, many of us have been very careful to not stigmatize gay men or to stigmatize sex or um, to, to turn into sort of modern day Nancy Reagans and just say no to, to sex and, and gay pride. But we do have to say that this virus is now spreading quietly and, and broadly among the gay community. We have 21 cases in New York now. Um, and that's gonna have to talk very frankly about safe sex, safe socializing over the next few few months until we can get it under control. We're on the cusp of potentially, you know, having this sort of sustained in the gay community uh, over the next few months and years, which would be which would be a shame because we we have the tools. We have a vaccine to to stamp it out. Um, we have the ability to to, to treat it. Um, but you know, if we keep making the same mistakes as COVID and HIV, we're going to be in a situation where we, we're dealing with another sort of persistent virus among gay men. Do you want to uh, maybe just take a second to, for listeners, you know, many people may have been sort of paying a little bit of attention to this, but not as much. What What are the things you think from a public health point of view that people should know about monkeypox and and who's at risk and what they're at risk for? I mean, what, what do you wish that everybody knew? So one is it's a disease that's been around for a long time, endemic in West and Central Africa, and we've ignored it because we ignore diseases that um, affect poor people in foreign countries. That's basically why we have neglected tropical diseases because they're neglected by us. The context of this pandemic, its outbreak, it has been initially seen in a, in a cohort of gay men who were part, part of um, raves in the Canary Islands and in Portugal, um, but is now spread to 41 countries, largely among men of sex with men, but not exclusively. Again, it's spread by close physical contact. So it's not just, um, it, it's not about safe, you know, safer sex at all. Um, it's about refraining from sexual contact, sharing of clothing, um, other objects. How about a yeah. handshake? A handshake? If you have a lesion on your hand, you're going to shake somebody's hand, touch your eye, you're going to have monkeypox. So, so potentially, like, you know, potentially. Potentially. Yeah. You know, there's there's some idea that the presentation of this um, in this outbreak has been around sort of the intergenital region, but it's not exactly the case. There's, there's been disseminated sort of lesions across the body. Um, and you're highly infectious until those um, legions scab up and fall off. And so this is why people are so worried that um, um, this is going to entrench itself. And, in the and what's community. what's a lot? What's the biggest harm of, of it? Like, what what can it do at its extreme? At its extreme, th this strain has not been responsible for that many deaths at all in, in, in West Africa. Um, in the other, the, the, the Congolese version, which will soon be renamed, um, has a higher uh, fatality fatality rate. We also don't know, and right now we haven't had any deaths from it. Um, if it gets into immunocompromised populations, if it gets into children, um, we don't know what will happen. You know, a friend of, a colleague of mine, um, Dimitri Daskalakis, who's at the Center for Disease Control, 
I said, think of this like MRSA. It's in the gay community now, but um, MRSA went from the gay community to health clubs. Mer and MRSA, just just for d definition, for you want to just methicillin resistant? Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is a, a bacterial infection of the skin that's drug resistant. Um, there's an outbreak in gay men and then showed up in health clubs. And so, you know, just because it's now limited to the gay community and a subsection of the gay community doesn't mean it's not going to sort of emerge in, in large population centers like New York and others. Um, uh, in, in other populations. And then, then you know, it's hard to know if it'll sustain itself. Um, and, um, you know, the big fear is that it gets into the people who potentially are HIV positive but are, don't know their status. There's lots of reasons why you might see a more severe presentation, even though right now we've had no deaths uh, really among most of the cases that are circulating around the world, mm -hmm. at least outside of its endemic region. One of the things we haven't talked about that you're enormously prolific and productive in writing lay pieces, not just for the scientific literature, but pieces in um, in political science magazines, in Washington Post, in the New York Times, and so on. How do you pick and choose for that what you're going to decide to write for the public? Because public health communications, I think, is so important but there's only so much time you have for that, and you've done a lot of it. Well, I mean, you know, Harland and Joe and a bunch of us have written a lot on FDA stuff. So there's things I care about, drug regulation and, and the regulatory state, particularly the regulation of drugs and devices and biologics. So I've written a lot about that, a lot on COVID. Um, a friend of mine, Zen Rivzi, who was at the law school um, a few years ago, and is now public citizen in DC, are writing a piece on monkeypox vaccines right now. Um, I got a gig as a nation public health correspondent last year, and my editor sort of tends to, to poke me on certain issues, but, you know, gives me wide latitude to write what I want. I mean, after COVID, you know, it's hard to think about, you know, if I'll sustain that level of sort of commitment to public writing. The more episodic work I've done over the past um, is probably more of a, a template for what I think I'll do in the future. Any, any parting words for... For students coming up and who look at a career like yours, nonlinear, highly impactful, uh, you know, to, to give them courage, to be able to give them the ability to make choices, not that others expect of them, but ones that they really can follow their hearts and, and what they really want to do. Any, you know, we appreciate you being on today, but that's one of the things I think about you is that it, you know, it's an inspiring path and one where you did have the courage, the bravery to, to move forward in ways that maybe were a little unconventional, uh, but highly impactful. I mean, people make lots of um, spectacular achievements going from A to B, but I'll never forget when Jerry Freeland, who is an all, a colleague of all of ours, um, gave a lecture to the, the medical students a few years ago and drove a, drew, drew a squiggly line on the, on the board and didn't tell anybody what it was. And then he talked about his life. Jerry was going to be a sociology PhD, went off to the Peace Corps, met Alan Rosenfeld, who became the dean of the School of Public Health at Columbia, but he you know, was the doctor of record for the Black Panthers. You know, so there's lots of people we know that are among us who've taken sort of circuitous routes to where they are today. And I think it's trust your gut. A lot of Yale undergraduates, when I was here, were so afraid of sort of stepping off the, the, the well-trodden path that, of success that they'd had in high school and that they, you know, they assumed they were going to go, go to Yale, go to medical school, go to law school. There's a, there's a very strong pressure to conform, which, um, you know, despite the creativity and innovation at this place is, is can weigh down young people. And I'd say, trust your gut, because in the end, you know, you have to live with yourself, not your parents or your, your professors or, or your peers. And so um, I don't think I would do things differently if I had to do it all over again, um, even though, you know, it, it, it was a little bit of a wild ride of a life. <laughs> I do want to say one thing in imparting words we, we haven't mentioned before but you've alluded to it. You have been an incredible mentor um, and collaborator with our students on, on campus and some of whom have graduated from campus. And when I talk to students that have graduated from here, some of whom are already uh, faculty members, many of them will still say like the paper they're most proud of is the paper they did with you. Um, and so I just want to thank you on behalf of them and our listeners for what you've been able to do to help develop careers. Yeah, thank well, you, Greg. And thanks for joining us. Happy. No, thanks for having me, Harlan and Howie. Well, Howie, that was great. So let's move on to the next segment where we can hear what's keeping you up or, or occupying your attention these days. 
Yeah, so you, you had a great thread on Twitter this week about the horrible financial impact that healthcare has on a relatively large chunk of society based on a Kaiser Health News article by Noam Levy. It indicated that over 100 million people, almost one in every three in America, are saddled with medical debt. And that's not new. Even in the decade after Obamacare, which was supposed to be the, quote, Affordable Health Care Act, out-of-pocket health spending is very high. It's enormously impactful to even upper-income groups. All it takes is one catastrophic illness or condition, and you could be saddled with lifelong debt or worse, including bankruptcy. So I wanted to pivot from that thread, which I thought was a very important story, but to the other end of the spectrum. Our recent guest, Dean Sherry Gleid of the Wagner School at NYU, just published a paper in Health Affairs that confirms that our two-decade experiment with health savings accounts, or HSAs, has mostly failed. Um, these are the accounts that people have combined with a uh, high deductible health plan, and we may call them consumer directed health plans, um, and a lot of people have them now. They bring no efficiency gains. In other words, these plans, uh, of which, by the way, 30% of what most employees are choosing now, so it's a large part of the population, do not lead you to spend money more wisely. They just allow for a tax break primarily for higher income individuals. It's a regressive policy. And full disclosure, I, along with tens of millions of others, benefit from this policy. I've used an HSA or prior to that a flexible spending account for a while. Our government, in a purported effort to make healthcare spending more efficient, has instead just codified another means for an individual to reduce their federal tax obligations. And in this case, it's to the tune of about $12 billion per year, which is not chump change. So at the very same time that so many lower income individuals struggle to pay off health care debt, we are lavishing more tax breaks on the better off with no seeming policy reason other than this lower tax burden. And, and Sherry Gleid, Dean Gleid, thinks this policy should be undone, and, and I agree. You know, that, that's a really interesting point, and I, I'm glad you raised it. I'll get back to the, the Twitter, you know, uh, stream that I put together, the, the the reflection on that article, look, I'm always impressed by the studies that show that about half of America doesn't even have $500 to manage a financial emergency. And our health care system imposes such profound financial harm on people, leading people to avoid care, leading people who need care to be saddled with debt. It's, it's a side effect of our system. And look, what I said was, no matter what we should identify this as a major problem. Whether you're for or against universal health care, whether or you're for or against a particular solution, then tell me what your solution is. Because we can't have a country where getting sick leads you to have your house foreclosed on, for your inability to put food on the table, for you to have anxiety, for you to, to have such worries. I mean, it's just simply not the kind of society that we should want to live in. And for the richest nation in the world to have a record like this, you, you know, we doctors are imposing harm every day because every bit of care for people who can't afford it leaves them weaker and, and in a position uh, where, where they're struggling as a result of this. We, we can promote health, but, but actually we're not promoting well-being because they're, they're in these disastrous situations. And for some people, it's devastating. So yeah, it's, I think I so want to call on the nation. What is the solution? I mean... So universal health care is one solution. The government actually takes on the responsibility. That's what happens in most advanced societies. If we're un unprepared to do that, then what are we prepared to do? But this status quo can't, can't continue. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and look, it's taken me, it's a long evolution for me because I was very, in the 1990s when I finished business school, I was extremely pro-market. I really thought the market could solve most problems. And now I've come pretty much 180 degrees where I feel like we've, we've given the market every possible opportunity to fix some of these big problems and it's not able to. But on the other hand, I'm also much more aware now than ever before that the political realities to fixing this are so challenging. And so I personally think that we as professionals within healthcare systems have to help reshape the way we deliver care, even if our government institutions aren't able to do it. And people are afraid for change, but they have to realize the harm imposed by the status quo. 
And so we have to, uh, it's true, things can always get worse, but they're not great now for a vast majority of Americans who are saddled with debt as a result of receiving health care. And so, you know, we, we need to be able to, to fix that. Yep. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K-Y-A-L. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track and founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs, or you can check out our website at som.yale.edu backslash EMBA. How many people do you think have gotten an MBA under your auspices since the whole time you've been at Yale? Oh, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, right? hundreds. And, and, a, a, and a few hundred physicians alone. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management. Thanks to our researcher, Jenny Tan, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks, Harlan. Talk to you soon.